Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to session 26A2, City of Bellevue Pipe Defect Evaluation and Trenches Repairs. My name is Ronnie Piowski with Osborne Consulting, and I will be your moderator. I am pleased to introduce Craig Christensen, who is a project manager in the Water and Wastewater Group at David Evans and Associates Incorporated, located in Bellevue, Washington. He has over 10 years experience in planning, design, and construction observation of water, storm drain, and sewer facilities. He has a BS in civil engineering from the University of Washington and is a registered professional engineer in the state of Washington. His communication skills and organized project approach assure his clients that their projects are addressed in an efficient and complete manner. He has served special purpose districts and cities in Western Washington for his entire career. In this capacity, Craig has gained the confidence of his clients to understand their needs beyond the limits of the project in the context of the agency's challenges and opportunities. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, hopefully I can figure out how to get this to work. All right, good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming and attending uh, my talk. So um, as she stated, I'm Craig Christensen. Um, we're gonna talk about pipe defect evaluation and trenchless repairs. Um, project that we've done over the last couple of years with the city of Bellevue Utilities Department. So, Backwards. So a little bit of introduction um, on me. Um, as most of us know, and we've kind of, it's been a theme that we've talked about in this um, conference, relationships is a big deal in our industry. I think it's something that we should all focus on more. Um, it's been kind of hard the last couple of years. So this is a little introduction for me, even though I don't get to know all of you, you get to know a little bit about me. Um, so I was born and raised in Washington, um, specifically in Renton, Washington. Um, I graduated from the University of Washington, 2009. Um, I work for CHS Engineers, which some of you may know. Um, that was a company that my dad started um, in the early 80s before I was even born. Um, and I worked there until we merged with David Evans and Associates in 2020 and we became their water and wastewater group. So it's still CHS underneath David Evans, essentially. Um, so I'm currently a project manager, um, water wastewater group um, for DEA. And here's a couple of the clients that I've worked with over my career. Um, today, we're gonna talk about a project for the city of Bellevue. Um, here's some pictures about me and my family. So um, I love food, I love coffee. We're going to see that I also love spreadsheets. It's going to be a big theme in this presentation. Um, and just a little fun fact about Spokane. Spokane actually right down below us here in the streets hosts Hoop Fest, which is the largest three on three basketball tournament in the entire world. Happens every summer. I've been going for years. There's my team down there in the middle. Um, I also volunteer a lot with my church and in my community. And my favorite thing to do is spend time with my family. So this is kind of hard to be here because I have two little kids, another one coming soon, and I don't get to see him for four days. But that's my son, Steele, in the bottom left. That was a while ago. He's a lot bigger now. And then my daughter, Hazel, is in the picture on the, I guess I've been saying left, but it's actually the right for you guys. Um, and she actually turns three tomorrow. So that'll be pretty exciting. Okay, so city of Bellevue. Um, I've worked on water, wastewater, um, and storm projects for the city since I started in 2009 in the industry. Um, our office is in Bellevue, so I'm very familiar with a lot of their system. Um, I'm just gonna give you a quick overview of the system. So the city's drinking water system has 40,000 plus connections, 613 miles of water main. Sewer system, 37,000 plus customers, 13,000 manholes, 516 miles of sewer main, 120 miles of side sewer laterals. Their storm system has 21,000 plus structures, over 400 miles of storm main. And then here's a couple pictures. I don't know how to get the little... I don't know how to do the little 
pointer, but that's all right. So kind of an overall picture of the system. Um, it was primarily constructed 1940s, 1980s, like most systems in the Pacific Northwest. Um, between the sewer and storm, which is the project that um, I'm gonna talk about today, mostly concrete, some corrugated metal pipe, um, and then their water system has more cast iron, ductile iron. Um, so as we know in the industry, typical life expectancy of those, all those pipes combined obviously varies 40 to 100 years, depending on the material that is in the ground, the water table, um, all kinds of different things affect that. Um, so historically, with at least my work, we've done small to medium projects over the past couple decades. Um, and then over the last couple of years, we've started to increase and do a lot larger projects to deal with the, pro with the life expectancy getting close to the end. There's a lot more pipes that need to be repaired. So the last couple of years, we've done these pipe defect repairs. Um, some of you may have been in the presentation yesterday done by Amy um, Carlson and Shelby Smith um, from Jacobs and from the city. Um, that is also the same project. They talked more about the funding side. We're gonna talk more about the meat and potatoes evaluation part of the project. Um, so the scope of work, um, breaking down into the four tasks that we did. First task is the prioritization of the assets. Assets, I'm gonna say, an asset is a pipe in between two structures. That's what we're gonna call it from now on. Um, task two was evaluating the assets that we selected that were prioritized. And then those are the ones that we're gonna be rehabbing. Um, task three was design, where we split it into two different packages. Um, Trench list was done by my company and then dig and repair was done by Jacobs and Osborne. And we kind of, I mean, we helped each other throughout that process as well. Um, but those were who took the leads and then construction similar. So task one, prioritization. So the city has a asset database. There's a thousand pipes in there that are all different categories of needing repairs. Um, so we, as a, as a consultant team, work together with the city's construction group, with their asset management program, and with their O&M group. And we went through and looked at all the work orders and started to prioritize them to see, okay, here's the ones that are going to be close to failure soon that we need to focus on. Here's ones that are going to be lower priority. So kind of the, the three main bullets of what we did. So we took the work orders from the asset management database that the O&M group puts together when they go out and do routine maintenance throughout the year. We put those at the top of the list. Then we also looked at assets that were identified for repair in years prior, but never actually got done due to permitting easements, things like that. Those also got put to the top. We also took low and medium um, priority assets that are located on streets planned for pavement overlay. And we did that the first year that we did this project and it kind of bit us a little bit. Um, and so that's something that we're kind of looking at going forward if we're gonna keep doing that. Um, Cause it's kind of just like the picture here, we were kind of chasing after pavement, which is hard to do sometimes. Um, so after that initial prioritization, um, which we did a lot in conjunction with the city, um, we also started to remove some assets that were up in the top priorities. Um, if an asset was on a no dig street because of pavement, recent pavement overlay, we took that out. If um, an asset was in um, a area where the city was going to do a transportation project soon or they knew there was going to be a redevelopment. We also push those ones because the developer will help pay for it instead of having the city front the whole cost. Um, after that, we sent that priority list to the city for review. A lot of numbers on this page, but basically the bold part is what we're going to, we're starting with. So after we gave that list to the city, 
they looked it over, they said, okay, that's good. So we took in 2020, we took the 96 assets, as you can see the breakdown, and those are the ones that we were gonna evaluate. And then 2021, we doubled that amount, and those are the ones we were gonna evaluate. So the fun part. Task two, evaluation. So the first thing that we did to help keep everything organized, very simple, but sometimes not done, made folders for every single asset. 96, 197, lots of folders. We put all information that we got from the city into those folders for each asset. We had CCTV, we put it in that folder. City work order forms, maps, pictures, as built, anything that was related to that asset we put in that folder, keep it all in one place and organize. Along with that, we also set up my favorite, the master spreadsheet, which I created. It's really hard to see all the words, and this is only a little portion of it, but essentially we would take all that information as we gathered it and put it into the spreadsheet and then start color coding. So the color coding, we basically started out with everything coming in white. When you start looking at it, kind of want to fall asleep because there's a lot of information in there. Um, so then we started to look, okay, here's information. If it's red, that's information that we need for the project we need for design, but we don't have. So it's a trigger to, hey, we need to go find that, talk to someone at the city, figure out where that information is, or it's important information that we have conflicting numbers. Either CCTV says the pipe's only 50 feet long. Well, the work order says the pipe's 100 feet long. Something's wrong there. So we had to, it was conflicts or important information. Yellow was kind of stuff that conflicted, but it wasn't something that we needed to deal with right away. Um, and then once something was confirmed, multiple sources gave us the same information, then we bolded it so we knew, okay, this is solid information. Um, so the next step was reviewing CCTVs. Don't do this in the afternoon after you've had lunch is my recommendation. Um, I've watched a lot of sewer videos and they're actually, I mean, I think it's interesting. Some people think it's interesting. Some people probably don't. <laughs> um, probably the coolest things that I've seen in there is you're going along and it's usually they're following someone that's cleaning it. And I've seen actual animals inside laterals that are hiding from the sprayer as it's going by. It's pretty crazy. Um, okay, so a couple notes on reviewing CCTV. So I took, I watched most of them, but there's other, some other um, younger engineers that I kind of walked through so they would get to know how to do it. But I would take very detailed notes. So first slide or the first screen of a CCTV tells all information about the pipe. We would use that to check against the spreadsheet, make sure that it was the actual asset that we were gonna be looking at. A lot, you'd be surprised at the amount of times that the information that's on there doesn't actually match the asset that we're looking at, which is not good because then we're gonna say, contractor, go repair this asset. It's 400 feet long, there's a repair in the middle. Contractor goes out, repairs not there, completely different material, not good. So you take a lot of notes and that's why we have the spreadsheet, keep all that information together. Um, there's also a lot of additional CCTV that's needed. The city would have their database, some of those pipes haven't been CCTV'd in 10 years. So those, and some of those structure numbers that are on the beginning that are used to tie the asset to um, the location are also old manhole numbers from when that was a sewer district that the city assumed. So we had to keep all this information pretty close so we knew what we were actually looking at. Um, just kind of a side note, just, I know there's other municipalities obviously here, review your CCTV standards be specific on how, because you're hiring a third party to do it mostly. Sometimes you do it in-house, which you probably need good, you need good standards either way, but specifically if you're hiring an outside source, sometimes they go too fast, then the CCTV is worthless. 
sometimes they get a piece of toilet paper stuck on it and that operator might be looking at his phone instead of the actual video and he doesn't see that three quarters of the video you can't even use so be very um, specific in your standards on how fast one thing that we always try to get our clients to do is have the cctv or the operator will literally stand before they put the that little camera robot device down into the manhole and down into the pipe we have them do a 360 degree sweep around the area before they go in that way you actually know it's where it says it is because they can put any address they want but is it the actual pipe okay so when i'm looking at these cctvs there's lots of different defects that we look for um we're looking at we're looking at it trying to decide what does this pipe need to be repaired is there actual defects and then what are those defects is it something that can be repaired trenchlessly or is it something that needs to be open cut repaired um, one thing that i also did was i would and it's not because i didn't trust the work orders from the city but i would try to have an unbiased view of the cctv before i would look at it so i wouldn't look at the report that was given with it i would watch it because once again there's also been times where i've watched one and look at the work order and it's not the same it doesn't match and so i always would look prior and then use that to confirm what i saw um, a lot of different stuff here um, the two that kind of overlap between both which is what i'll kind of mention um, broken pipe so we'll get more into the how and what trenchless repairs look like. But essentially, if there's a broken pipe, we see a pipe. If it's broken internally, that means you're probably not gonna be able to do a trenchless repair because a liner is not gonna go through a broken pipe coming into the internal diameter. If the broken pipe is just cracked, usually then we can do a liner. If it's really cracked, but it hasn't fallen in, we'll do a structural liner. Um, Something that we actually talked about in the class yesterday um, in kind of the Q&A part was deformed pipe. When pipes are deformed, typically you would do a hydraulic capacity analysis to figure out, does this pipe need to be as big as it is or can it get smaller? In this project, because we're kind of churning through as many pipes as we can get, we didn't go into hydraulic capacity analysis. And the reason why we didn't do that a lot of it also is because the pipes that we're dealing with are eight inch for sewer typically, which is in a neighborhood, usually not even close to capacity. So it wasn't a big deal. Um, I actually had originally put in some actual CCTV that we could watch but I decided that would be kind of a waste of time. So instead I took screenshots of the important parts. Um, so this is an asset that would obviously need a dig and repair. As you can see, the six inch pipe, which is also not normal for a main, but it's concaved in. So obviously you're gonna have to dig that up. If you put a liner through there, you'd get a four inch pipe and that would not be good. Um, and then the pipe on the right, you can see the deformities coming in on the side. Um, that's one where if this was a one-off project and we were doing just this, we would do a hydraulic capacity analysis to see if we put a liner through there, is that going to actually affect the future? Is it going to back up? If it's not, that is something that we could, depending on, let's say you're on a no dig street and you couldn't dig this pipe up, we could line it but it would reduce the capacity. So that's something we would do a capacity analysis if it was a one-off. Um, these are some trenchless defects. So it's kind of hard to see in the picture on the left, but that's a lot of corrosion. Typically a concrete pipe is smooth. That one is not. It's got a lot of aggregate. That's something that you would look for. Um, the more aggregate you can see, the more corrosion there's been in that pipe, the less life is going to be left um, sometimes the inverts were completely gone in some of these and so 
that kind of gets into H2S and what is going through the pipe if it's on, if it's in downtown Bellevue and there's a bunch of re restaurants putting grease in there, things like that, that can cause a lot of corrosion. Um, the asset on the left has cracking and so, and some offset, minor offset joints that could be done trenchlessly. So kind of the two big um, things are CCPV review and then site visits. Um, site visits for each asset were done in conjunction with a survey. So our survey group would go out, do a topo survey from manhole to manhole, structure to structure. Um, one of the biggest things that we would do though is take detailed structure measurements. Um, this isn't something that you normally would have a survey group do. So we had to be very specific and make little drawings and show them, okay, these are all, this is all the information you have to measure. The first time we did the project, I actually did most of those and went out with the survey group, not as cost effective. So this last year, I just made really detailed notes for them to do. But essentially, probably the biggest thing that we would do is you can see some of these catch basins are really small. What you don't, what you don't know if you haven't pulled one open is contractors don't always place the lid right over the neck of structure. Sometimes they're offset. Sometimes they're really offset. And so we're measuring, one of the things we would measure is we would measure, and I think you can see it somewhere in there, the opening. We call it the clear opening. So it's, if you pop the lid and look down and measure, what's the smallest, the biggest, smallest opening in that structure? Because if this is gonna be a trenchless repair, the contractor needs to be able to get their equipment through there. If they can't, well, it doesn't matter. We're gonna to have to dig it up. So that was some important information that we would get. We'd also take lots and lots of pictures. Um, so after we get all that information, we finalize the eval, we put it all in the spreadsheet. And then as a consultant team, we would meet, talk through each asset. Sometimes it'd be really brief. Looks like dig and repair. Good, put in the dig and repair package. Sometimes that would take more in-depth discussion. Sometimes we'd bring in the city. Sometimes we'd bring in multiple people from the city, O&M, all kinds of different people to try to make a decision. Sometimes um, those assets would be really complicated and those would be punted to a next, the next year. Um, so then we would get our final recommendation, sent that all to the city. And so we went from 96, 77, 197 to 173. A lot of more numbers. You can see the breakdown between trench list, dig and repair. Um, so now we'll get into design. This is not an exhaustive list of trenchless methods, which I'm well aware of. There's also flood grouting, there's slip lining, there's spray in place lining. These are the type um, of repair methods that the city is comfortable with, that we've been using for years and they've been working. So these are the ones we've been doing. Pipe bursting says trenchless because if you know anything about pipe bursting, it's not always trenchless, but it can be trenchless. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. And that's something that is new for the city in this year's project. We didn't do it in the first year, we're doing it this year. So first we'll go through cured in place lining. So for those of you who don't know what cured in place lining is, I'll give a quick and easy description of it. Essentially, you would clean the pipe out. You'd take a resin-filled sock. You pull that resin-filled sock all the way through the pipe. You pressurize it with either steam or water or air. You cure it using steam or water or UV light. Voila. You let it drain out. And it's obviously you have to bypass it at the same time. You're left with a hardened new pipe inside the existing pipe. Um, the three different methods that we used in this project were full length liners, structure to structure, or spot repairs in some cases where 
the majority of the pipe was in good condition, but there's one location that needs, needs a liner. Um, one thing that we would do also is every year we've done kind of a cost benefit analysis, pretty rudimentary. We would talk to some contractors who do lining. We would figure out, okay, we have a 400 foot pipe. It needs two spot repairs at pretty far locations away from each other. Is it actually cost effective for the city to do two spot repairs or is it more cost effective to just line the whole thing? And so we would do that analysis early on in design to kind of figure out, okay, should the city just line that whole pipe? Does it cost less for MOB, things like that. Um, T and lateral liners is kind of a evolving, um, evolving industry. There's some that say they're trenchless. There's some that say that they aren't trenchless. Um, we basically, the first year we said they couldn't dig. We got a contractor who said they had to dig. And so it's been kind of going back and forth. So this year we added the ability to use vacatees um, to do some lateral lining. Essentially, it's just what it is. You would do a spot repair kind of at a lateral connection, and then the liner goes up the lateral. Typically, it's done depending on the municipality. The city of Bellevue owns up to the edge of the right of way or up to the edge of an easement. Um, and so we would line up to that point or up to a Y or a bend because lining doesn't really work, especially on those small diameters um, through that pipe bursting. If you don't know what pipe bursting is, I'll kind of give another quick little overview of what that is. There's a lot of videos online. I actually showed one to my wife and she actually understood it. So I think that's a good, it's a good way if you don't know what it is, look it up on YouTube. It's pretty interesting. So you basically pull a cable through the pipe. You attach it to the head of a pneumatic or um, a bursting head, which is then attached to the new pipe typically HDPE. Then a winch is attached to that and it's hydraulically pulled through the pipe. As it goes through, the old pipe is broken. The new pipe replaces it. Um, now, when we talk about it being trenchless, the reason why it's trenchless, if the pipe is located at an outfall and you have a straight shot in, it can be trenchless. If, there's, if it's really deep, and there's laterals attached, obviously you pull that pipe through, you have to reconnect the laterals and you have to dig at each, a, to dig a pit at each location of laterals to reconnect it. So for this project, we chose assets that were either next to an outfall that we could use or were really shallow and didn't have any laterals attached for the trenchless effect. But in the future, Pipe bursting might be used in the dig and repair. That's kind of up to decision. This is kind of a pilot project for the city, um, these couple assets. Okay, so next part of design is kind of normal. Most people should know this. We put together a quantity takeoff, different spreadsheet, also very detailed, keep track of Okay, we got sewer, we got storm, tax applies to one, tax doesn't apply to the other. We have to do all this information, keep it all um, pretty segmented. So in case an asset in the middle, because there's plenty of times where in the middle of design or towards the end of the design, an asset got removed because we were waiting for easement information. City couldn't find it, gets punt, punted to the next year. And if you've worked in Excel, deleting a line can screw up all your formulas. Not good. So you have to keep good records and all of that. We then do project manual, technical specs, cost estimate to try to figure out, okay, how much is this going to cost? That's something we talked about yesterday in the class. Very difficult to try to figure out the costs of um, these projects, especially in this climate. Um, so there you can see the numbers going from how many we said need to be repaired to then how many we're actually gonna repair based on the costs, based on which ones didn't get punted. Um, 
a little bit on construction management. We would send the design to the city. It would be good. We'd send it out. The city would put it out to bid. We would answer RFIs if they came in, request for information. Um, some key things that we would do during construction. Um, in these projects, we would require the contractor to pre-CCTV all of the lines before they did the repair. The reason for that is, as I talked about earlier, some of those CCTVs are 10 years old. I could look at that CCTV 10 times over and say, okay, there's a spot repair right here because of corrosion from a restaurant lateral because they have lots of fog going into it. Well, that was 10 years ago. If that restaurant's been pumping it out for 10 years, it's gonna be a lot worse. But if I can't see it, I can't design it. So they would always, we would always have them CCTV before. Also plenty of times a pipe has collapsed or broken into at certain points. And so they always would do that. So we could then have the contractor and the city inspector make a decision on the fly. Okay, this one looks like it needs two spot repairs now, or the spot repair is a little bit longer. So we're going to line the whole pipe. Um, also submittal reviews, CIPP design submittals, pretty complicated. They're also in their own little spreadsheet with all kinds of crazy formulas. Essentially, we would look through and see, okay, do they have the right depth? Do they have... Typically they assume the water table at ground level, which is a good assumption if you don't have information better than that. Um, all kinds of other information, we would check that, make sure the thickness is right, except as built at the very end of the project to keep the city's GIS system up to date, we would give them all the information from the spreadsheet. They can put that all in their asset management software, update records, we would also give then transmit all of the as builds to them as well, so we can not have repeat assets that were repaired last year come back because they haven't been updated. That's all. Thanks for coming and listening to my presentation. I want to give special thanks to the city of Bellevue for letting us work on this project. I know Linda's back there from the city. Um, Debbie Harris, Shelby Smith, and then with Jacobs, who's been our partner on this for with Amy Carlson. So thank you to them and thank you guys for listening. Any questions? Typically, no. I can tell a quick story. So we did it we have done i've done probably tens of thousands of feet or designed tens of thousands of feet of pipe bursting the only time that i've known that it's gotten stuck we did a pipe bursting job when i first started um, in shoreline and we were actually bursting underneath an apartment building and this is why you would cctv but we cctv this Everything was fine, went to pipe burst it. The contractor originally, which wasn't on the as built, had poured a concrete block around the pipe right underneath the apartment building. So contractors pulling the pipe in, bursting, get stuck. They keep pulling, they keep pulling, they keep pulling breaks, which is a steel line, very dangerous didn't kill anyone luckily, but actually in the apartment, there was someone living in the apartment right above and it actually cracked their floor because of the amount of pressure that had to be pulled. So then the contractor had to come in with strip off their carpet, take their excavator, slam on the floor to get it back down into place. So it has been done. It has, but typically no. I mean, we look at, as built records and make sure we just started doing pipe bursting for one of our water districts which is slightly more complicated because they can have stainless steel um, connections and things and so those you can't burst through you have to dig them up but
Anyone else? Linda. Uh, thanks. Um, I was remembering from about maybe three or four years ago, uh, uh, a uh, CIPP contract where there, we had a lot of change orders due to the uh, the distance to the defect not being uh, as as per spec per design. The contractor actually didn't find the defect there, but they found it someplace else. So um, I was just wondering um, in in this upcoming project, um, how are we making sure that that the uh, actual location of the defect is for a lining project is is going to be where it's supposed to be? That's a good question. So part of CC, part of CCTV reviewing is you are subject to whoever was doing the operating of the CCTV. There are many times where, and you almost have to watch a couple to see, sometimes an operator will start at four feet at the start of the pipe because they're saying the center line is zero feet is at the center of the structure. And so then that's accurate when you're going through. Other times they start zero at the start of the pipe. And so then everything's four feet off. Really the only way to have it be perfect is to have CCTV done during design and have a new record that you know. That's really the only way to know exactly. Um, and in these projects, at least up until this point, we haven't had the ability in the timeline to have everything CCTV. I mean, we're talking about 197 assets to get all those new CCTV. In some cases, we have a good CCTV, so we wouldn't need that. But in other cases, it might be good to get that done pre-design so we can find out things like that. Yeah. So bellies are, yeah, bellies are complicated. It's also really difficult to tell from a CCTV if there's actually a belly or if it's a blockage. Um, because most of the time you're pulling through, you're watching the CCTV and bloop, it turns into a submarine, goes underneath the water, you can't see anything, and then it pops back up sometimes. Sometimes the operator just ends the CCTV and that's all you have. But when we actually know there's a belly that, and it's a significant belly, it would be one that we would do a dig and repair. You can line through a belly and sometimes that will help the belly, depending on the location. Um, but it's also pretty difficult to figure out if there's actually a belly or not. I mean, they have equipment in CCTV where you can actually see if it's a consistent slope, but I would say most CCTVs don't utilize that. And so you can't tell for sure. You just have to kind of watch the video and see, oh, it looks like it's starting to bend down. But does that kind of answer your question? Depends on this. I mean, it, it honestly depends. We have lined some if it's a minor belly. If it's a major belly, we're not going to line because that's not really going to help. I mean, it'll help if there's a corrugated metal pipe and it's got a belly. If you line it, it's going to help because you're going from bloop, bloop, bloop to smooth. But yeah. We so we bid them separately. That's why there's the trench list is bid as its own package, and the dig and repair is bid as its own package. Although we do have some crossover, and that's part of the thing that we're trying to refine every year. This last year, there was lots of lining in the dig and repair because if there's three pipes in a row, back to back to back, if one of them is a dig and repair and the other two are liners, we put that all in the dig and repair just to save the city money on Mob. But sometimes it doesn't actually save the city money and that's kind of hard to figure out. And so, yeah, we have them separated now, but that's something we're always looking at to see 
if it's the right way. We've allowed the contractor to decide. Um, we've only done UV cure on a one-off project for the city a couple of years ago, and it worked well. Um, we've used DEA, we've designed UV liners, and they're good because a lot of times you can do it without a bypass too, which can save some money. Um, so we have used it, and specifically for these projects, we don't tell them what to use, but it's usually Michaels that wins these because they can get the best cost and they can do it all and they have a lot of crews. So we're trying to get some more competition in there by having different methods, but. No, no. Um, hi guys, thank you for attending. We are out of time. Um, but if you would like to chat with Craig more, um, I'm sure that out there. you would be cool with that. <laughs>